course, the AACM, which Roscoe Mitchell is so instrumental in, may be the best known of the not-for-profit organizations in Chicago that have been supporting jazz for many years. But at this point, probably the second best such organization is the Jazz Institute of Chicago. And uh, Dick Buckley is standing by to talk with one of the people, two of the people, who founded the Jazz Institute of Chicago and tell us some more about it. Dick? Right. The Jazz Institute is responsible primarily for the programming of the show tonight. And each... Each festival keeps getting better and better, and this is kind of the culmination of uh, something that started with very humble beginnings, and I have a couple of the people who were in on the beginning. Harriet Choice, who is the executive travel editor of the Chicago Tribune and longtime writer about jazz and friend of jazz, and Dan Morgenstern, who is head of the Institute for Jazz Studies. Now, Harriet, I knew that you had something to do with the founding of the Institute, but it was a surprise to me that Dan was. Dan, you've done so many things. Uh, how about, uh, how did you get in on the founding of the Chicago Jazz uh, Institute? Well, I believe that the person responsible for involving me in that is none other than Harriet Choice. And uh, I happened to be living in Chicago at the time. I was editor of a magazine called Downbeat. And uh, it was really, it was Harriet's idea, and it was a wonderful idea. And uh, one of the things that was so remarkable about the Institute was that in its early days, it brought together uh, many of the different elements in the Chicago jazz scene who up to that point had if not exactly been hostile to each other and had very little communication with each other. Harriet. Uh, as the primary founder of this organization, it must have been a lot of work trying to get all this together, and as Dan just said, with the disparate uh, views on jazz. Well, we started out thinking that there should be an archive, and I think it's interesting that now we're really coming around to having an archive. And I had been down in New Orleans and seen their jazz museum and felt that there would be, should be some way of taking care of and preserving Chicago jazz. So I just started calling all the people who were involved, and th those early meetings were really something. Oh, we hassled them, you know, around with how we would do it, but our very first concert was also a free concert, and it was in 1969 at the Field Museum, and it too was free, and we had Art Hodes, Lil Armstrong, uh, Muhal Richard Abrams, and it was just a wonderful thing. And then afterwards, we wound up at a jam session with Mulhall on the piano, Wayne Jones on drums, and Franz Jackson on tenor, and three wildly divergent musicians you couldn't have found. And uh, that's how it all, all came started. off, huh? Yeah. yeah. And also, Linda, Linda Prince, who has been sitting here beside me through uh, tonight and will be here through the next three sessions, uh, who is the producer of this program and who has just worked her little buns off uh, as a member of the committee that put the things together. Linda, uh, time to bring you into the conversation and talk about some more about the founding and a little bit about uh, the gentleman that I know you have some kind words for. Well, I don't want to uh, avoid what could be viewed as a conflict of interest because in addition to uh, sitting behind the microphone here on the broadcast, I was also one of the people, along with Neil Tesser, who was involved in uh, putting together this fourth annual jazz festival. But both Neil and myself were around in 1979 when the uh, first suggestion was made to bring a free jazz concert into Grant Park. It was uh, an idea that had been kicked around by people in the Institute for a couple of years, and it came to fruition in 1979. And the group of people who helped put it together had six weeks to put together what turned out to be a wildly successful week of music. And the man who spearheaded that committee and the man who spearheaded uh, most of the Jazz Institute's activities in the late 1970s was a man that all of us here at this table remember very fondly, Don DeMichael. Don was a, a musician, he was a critic, he was a lover of jazz, had a pair of the biggest ears in the music business, he was a drummer, he was a vibraphonist, he was a, my mentor in a way, and I know he was very helpful to Don. It's sad in a way, uh, Don died February 4th, not to have his presence here, but his presence is here in some ways. Well, you know, Linda, Monday night, uh, when I went home, I got to feeling a little teary, uh, and I missed Don. But then I started remembering his wild sense of humor and all the fun that we had and how blessed we were to have known him and to have heard him. And we talk a great deal about what he did for jazz and uh, that he was a very fine musician. And I want to say something about the quality of his life. Don had a passion for living. He would go, he would go to his day gig, 
then he would go play, and then he'd spend the rest of the evening hanging out and hearing music. He lived his life well, and he did a lot. And though we, I miss him very much, I feel very, very good. And seeing the festival and how beautiful it is, I think we can all be very happy that we've been with Don DeMichael. Well, I know that Neil Tesser is standing downstairs as well, and um, we see that the music is getting ready to go on stage. I know that you would say that Don would be real amazed by the variety of the music that we've got here. And I know, Harry, you're going to have to get... Uh, on stage in about a minute to go introduce the next group. But Dan, as, as a writer and critic, and Neil, you might want to say something as well. Uh, the Toshiko Akiyoshi Big Band, uh, Lutabakan Big Band, is now being viewed by many as the finest uh, in the music business. Well, it's uh, one of the very, very few big bands formed uh, within the last 10 years that uh, has been able to maintain itself and that is quite an achievement in itself and uh, also has been able to in spite of the problem of keeping a permanent personnel which is an immense problem uh, been able to maintain a very high musical level and uh, an identity of its own uh, incidentally uh, Lou and uh, Toshiko are moving back to New York very soon and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the band there. Of course, it will then consist of different people, but I believe that same musical uh, identity will, will maintain itself. Dan, I wonder, as one who uh, attends a lot of festivals, uh, what's your impression of the Chicago Jazz Festival? Oh, it's marvelous. Last night, uh, when I was emceeing, of course, I didn't get a chance to wander around outside, so I didn't really get the feel for it. But uh, one of the things that impresses me greatly, aside from the very high quality and wide variety of the music, uh, and the excellent uh, pacing of the program, and the marvelous stage crew that you have here, uh, which is an important element, is how well behaved the audience is. There are masses of people out there, uh, but there's a good feeling. And I frankly don't know of many other cities where something like this could come off. It's right in the heart of, of Chicago, and you have a, a wide variety of people there, and they all seem to be enjoying themselves. Uh, uh, no problems, and uh, that's that's great. That's the I thing. think it says something for the music. Too. That, yeah, that's that's the thing that has struck me at every one, and I've been to every one of the festivals. The people are here to hear jazz, and if somebody's causing a disturbance, he's the one who better look out, and it, it hardly ever happens. But Dick, uh, can I jump in here for sure, a minute? Neil. There's Neil Tesser over on the other side of the stage, and. Uh, uh, it's not only that these people are here to hear jazz, they're here to see jazz. These people are standing on their feet watching this band set up. And that's a fascination that I'm not sure you'd find in almost any other crowd even in this city. These people are seem to be doing more than stretching. They are genuinely fascinated by every aspect of the musicians setting up, of the drums being put in place, of the saxophone starting to tune, of the piano being wheeled out, and, and seemingly uh, straining on the tips of their toes for a chance to hear the first notes of this band start. And you know that everyone is here to hear a different type of music because of the wide variety of music that we have on the program, and yet the fact that uh, Cleanhead broke it up, and, and so did uh, Roscoe Mitchell. The people who were here to hear Cleanhead stayed and dug Roscoe Mitchell, and uh, now I know that the crowd will reach its peak with, with this great big band. Well, one, of, one of the things I noticed, Dick, too, is in uh, just observing the festival the past couple of years, People have been talking about, well, what is it that draws the, the people to the park? Is it a specific headliner? Is it the fact that it's jazz-free? It might be uh, just the, the whole attitude surrounding the event itself. I think uh, it seems to attract people. And one of the things that we've noticed is that this incredibly wide-ranging body of people, many of whom who come to uh, the festival with different experiences and, and levels of interest in jazz, have been receptive to and responsive to everything that's been on the program. And that, to me, is the most important thing about the Chicago Jazz Festival and why it remains so special. Linda. And Linda, there are so many of them. I uh, was speaking with uh, some people from the mayor's office a few minutes ago back here, backstage on the wings, and according to the official City of Chicago crowd count, there are between 30 and 35,000 people out here at Grant Park this evening. And you know that we have Larry Smith out there with a microphone to talk to some of those people. Let's see what kind of a reaction Larry gets from uh, someone in the, in the stands. 
Larry. Everything is going great here. It's a very friendly crowd. How about you, sir? What's your name? My name is Rich Feingold. Having fun? Having a great time. It's wonderful seeing all these people here in Chicago being out to listen to jazz. It's a healthy state of affair, and we look for you next year, too. Sir, how are you enjoying yourself? I'm enjoying myself immensely because I'm out here dancing. I've been out here dancing for ever since the jazz been in our gray. I've been out here dancing, having a good time, enjoying good people. All the people out here, enjoyable people. You keep right on stepping, stepping high. How about you, young lady? You having a good time? What's your name? Terry Aikens. Where are you from? Chicago. Has this affair met your great expectations so far? Yes, it's been great. It's been absolutely great. Okay, we're going to go back now to Dick and Linda. Well, one of the things that um, the audience, uh, our audio audience is missing is, is a lot of the visuals in the festival. Right now we've been talking about, uh, we've got an incredible big band setting up, a 17-piece ensemble. The uh, reed section plays a variety of instruments. It's not just saxophones. You've got a variety of clarinets. You've got flutes out there. The trumpeters are doubling on flugelhorns and percussion as well. But also when the audience, in addition to the people who are camping out on the grass and cooking and drinking and just relaxing to the variety of sounds, you've got some special entertainers out in the audience. We've had a couple of dancers uh, who have been out here, mimes, mimes and uh, dancers who've been out here basically uh, four years entertaining. And they've uh, been wonderful in inciting a crowd reaction on their own. And this is just in addition to the music. So it's, it's a, a festival in the best sense of, of the word. It's, it's, a, it's a happening of a, a variety of different types of people, and it works. Harriet and Dan, I want to thank you so much for stopping by. I know, Harriet, you have to go introduce the group because you are the MC tonight. Thank you both. And uh, thanks for coming by. Thanks for starting the Jazz Institute of Chicago so that we can have a night like this, Dan. Well, don't thank me. I think we should. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say anything about Don DeMichael, but I think he's very much with us here in spirit, and he'd be most pleased to see what has come of all this. I know that he's up there looking down and enjoying and probably sitting in on vibes up there in that great celestial orchestra. We have the band set up now and just about ready to go. The Lou Tobacco and Toshiko Akiyoshi Big Band. The band that has been voted number one in most of the jazz polls that we've had around the country. And uh, most of the time when they come to town, it costs some money to go hear it. You have to go to a club. This is all free. And with, they say, 35,000 people out there, I don't doubt it at all. We're standing by now, and Harriet Choice will be out to introduce the group to the 35,000 people who are here, just as we have been introducing the group to those of you who are out there. And here's Harriet. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now reached uh, our grand finale. And before we introduce the band, I'd like to say just a few words. They say that politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, when you take a big city, Chicago, big business, cool cigarettes, and a small grassroots organization, the Jazz Institute of Chicago, and come up with this, I do think that that is unique. Earlier in the week, a representative of Cool said that they certainly hoped and intended on being back here next year again, and I think that's very nice for all of us. Now, I also want to remind you that uh, we do have to get off promptly at 10.30, and if you're all still looking for something to do tonight, the Underground Jazz Festival is being held at Randolph and Green. Green is one block west of Halstead, and that starts around 11.30. Joe Williams is singing the blues at Rick's, and all over at the Blackstone, Joe Siegel's Jazz Showcase has the wonderful Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers upstairs. Bud Freeman downstairs, and I think there's going to be a lot of jamming tonight, so we hope to see you all over there. And now, a wonderful big band, the Toshiko Akiyoshi Lou Tabakan Big Band. Lou Tabakan is perhaps one of the hottest jazz flute player, as well as being a superb tenor player. And Toshiko, who first formed this band in 1973, we think so much of her as a composer and as an arranger that we forget her considerable talents as a pianist. And now what I think is the uh, wonderful ending to a wonderful evening, the Lou Tabakan Toshiko Akiyoshi Band.
Thank you very much. Good evening. And we are delighted every time we come back to Chicago. Uh, I personally love Chicago. I think a whole band does. And we are so delighted that we could play here for the uh, many audiences. The uh, second tune is a brand new tune that we recorded. Actually, it's a brand new album that we had out a year ago. Anyway, this particular one is written by Lou, and uh, he wrote about the Japanese animal called tanuki. Tanuki is a badger, and we Japanese think this tanuki has mysterious power and also love to drink. So, <laughs> a night like this, they will come, uh, come down from a mountain transform themselves into human form and turn the leaves to money and coming down from a mountain and go to a drinking shop and start drinking and get drunk, get stoned out. So, <laughs> so Lou, Lou likes this animal. So he has a written tune called uh, Tanuki's Night Out. Thank <laughs> you. 
first time in 1963 in a place called Blue Note. I played there for about a month. And that time, I met the French artist called, his name was Francis Padra. And uh, he was taking care of late Bad Powell. At that time, he was sick at uh, uh, tuberculosis and living in Paris. And that time, we used to uh, meet every weekend, but and at the Francis' house, and 
he will play sometimes and we listen to some record and I had a very wonderful time for a few days. Anyway, last fall, the band went to France, to Paris for the first time and the first time for me since 63. And Lou and I went to uh, Francis' house and he showed us the film of uh, Late Bat playing at the Blue Note. It was made by French television and uh, brought back a lot of memory for me. And so this is written uh, for that time and true to uh, Late Bud. It's called Remembering Bud.
Joel Baez. Thank you. The next tune is a, a tune that we recorded for our very first album back in 1974, and title tune. It features uh, loose flute, also features two Japanese drama called Suzumi Flair. Anyway, you don't see them here, and we have a cassette. So one of the, uh, one of the few progress is kind of positive thing. Other things are a lot of them are negative, but this one is very convenient. Anyway, you hear some very strange sound from a speaker. That's what it is. I hope you like it. It's called Kogum.
Martin. Before we close with another, another number, uh, quickly I'd like to introduce a member of the band. Uh, from trumpet section, your right, left, they are Mike Price, Don Fonero, Buddy Childers, and Steve Hostetter. Trombone section, from your right, left, they're Bob Sanders, Bruce Fowler, Dave Bowman, and Hart Smith. Saxophone section from your right, left, they are Bill Byrne, John Gross, Matt Kattengoop, Eric Mariental, and Drew Tabakin. <laughs> Rhythm section is Bob Bowman on bass and Joey Barron on drums. <laughs> the last number is called Chasing After Love.
listening to the program coming to you from Grant Park. It is uh, a bit of, it's a wee bit hectic right now. Uh, I guess we should take a, an ID. Should we let our stations identify themselves? Okay. We'll take 10 seconds out and then be right back to sign it off. You're tuned to Chicagoland Public Radio at 91.5 FM, WBEZ, Chicago. And the Toshiko Akiyoshi Lou Tobacco and Big Band played on as the power went out. The people stayed, the band stayed, the soloists came down front and took their solos without benefit of amplification, and the crowd dug it, believe me. Uh, it was different, to say the least. It kind of threw a monkey wrench in our plans, but uh, here we are back again. If we have any stations still with us, uh, I know that the flagship station here in Chicago is with us. There isn't a thing you can do when all of the power goes out, even your auxiliary power unit goes out. Uh, the whole thing went. They did manage to get it patched back together rather quickly, considering uh, the, uh, uh, the, the seriousness of it. Dick, Linda? that was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. It wasn't it, though. And with the band playing acoustically and the soloists coming down front and the crowd staying out there and listening, it was truly something to behold. And what, you know, this is a climax. What can we do to follow this? Well, despite the, the panic, uh, it was actually rather a wonderful musical moment. I, I as producer, was, was wondering, what should I do? Should I tear my hair out? Should I scream? No, I just <laughs> sat there on the stage and listened to the band play. Well, and just uh, reflecting on their performance, one of the things I was really impressed about, and I think most of the audience caught that, was uh, the Akiyoshi piano, which has always been overshadowed by the, uh, the brilliance of her composing and arranging, and also by the emphasis that Toshiko herself in her writing places on the skills of Lou Tabakin as flutist and tenor saxophonist. And I really got a kick out of hearing Toshiko tonight uh, reaffirming her bebop root. She's one of the uh, pianists to emerge in the 50s and really under the spell of Bud Powell. I know that Neil Chesser is in the wings and I think he's got Lou Tabakin and Toshiko Akiyoshi with him right now. Well actually I have Lou Tabakin standing here putting his tenor saxophone away and I, I wasn't going to bother either of them with an interview because that's a rather harrowing way to, uh, to bring about a finale for a set. But Lou Tabakin is here and he seems willing to talk for the moment. Has that happened to you recently? Is this band putting out so much power that you're overloading the lines all over the country? I don't know. I thought we were pretty conservative volume-wise. I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> Toshiko says I played too loud. Maybe it's my fault. It was during your solo, I think, that all this happened. And uh, standing where we are at the moment, Lou Tabakin and I on stage right in the wings, I, I got a view of things that perhaps Linda and Dick, you didn't, as it looked like fireworks going on outside the... Uh, the wall here of the band shell, and they're still going on. There's a burning wire there, and it doesn't look like a lot of fun. And the police are keeping people away at, at, a, at a great distance. But uh, with all that, as Dick Buckley mentioned, the band played on, and played on wonderfully. Well, we really had a great time. You know, usually an, an event this large is, you know, a little bit difficult, but uh, everything's run, run so smoothly, and, uh, you know, it's really great. I'm really enjoying it. That's, that's quite a testament to how smoothly things ran. Well, it wasn't the first five days, but uh, judging by today, it was uh, great. <laughs> well, if, if Lou Tabakin still thinks that things ran smoothly when we practically well, pulled the plug on the whole on performance. The outdoor, see? So we're okay. Well, I thought someone was trying to tell us something. <laughs> <laughs> In that it happened on the encore. Thanks very much, Lou, okay, nice and a uh, wonderful show. Thank you very much. See you again. Okay. Can I say just one thing? Go ahead, Dick. I worked for Norman Granz in 1954, and the talk of the organization was that they had just made their first tour of Japan in 1953, and Oscar Peterson and Norman Granz had heard a young lady playing the piano that they couldn't believe, who came out in traditional Japanese costumes, sat down at the piano, and wailed like Bud Powell. And they said, her name is Toshiko Akiyoshi. We're going to try to bring her to this country. Well, that was the first that I heard of Toshiko, and of course, the rest is history. Well, as, as we heard, that was a, a truly fiery way to, to cap an evening. And, and just sitting back and reflecting on the whole evening, I was impressed uh, by what the Chicago Jazz Festival does best. It presents a wide variety of music. I've always noted not just the music on the stage, but the reactions to it from the audience. We have an audience here, and the crowd estimate was about 35,000. Throughout this night, they've heard the blues, they've heard the new music of Roscoe Mitchell, they've heard bebop, they've heard African-rooted musical expression and a dynamic big band, and they responded to all of it as one, with an obvious enthusiasm for it all. 
What I was also impressed with was the reception for the Chicago group, both of whom were receiving some really important exposure, some really obvious talent in uh, Paul Berliner's Kudu, and also in the previously little heard New Hope Sextet. So it's really been a marvelous evening, uh, fire and mishaps and all. And well, so much for this evening, I would guess. Uh, were you about to say something, Dick? No, I was uh, just waiting for you, Neil. Oh, Go ahead. <laughs> thank goodness. As I was uh, saying so much for this evening, tomorrow evening promises more of the same and, and maybe even more than we had tonight. The way these festivals always work is that they start building at the beginning of the week, and by the time we hit the weekend, they're in full stride and really starting to catch on. Tomorrow night, starting at 6 o'clock, uh, Central Time here in Chicago at the Petrillo Bandshell and the fourth annual Chicago Jazz Festival. We'll be beginning the program with the Hubbard Street Swingers, a wonderful group that I think will surprise a lot of people outside of Chicago. It features Eddie Johnson and Johnny Board on tenor saxes and uh, Wilbur Campbell who was heard earlier this evening with the New Hope group. He was heard on drums, he'll be heard on fives tomorrow. They'll be followed by a blues group called Sons of Blues, the SOB Blues Band, and uh, they'll be bringing a, a younger generation's slant to the blues. And uh, they'll be followed by the duo of Steve Lacey and Mal Wald Waldron, two of the mo most individualistic musicians one could possibly imagine, and they'll be working together. Followed by the Ray Barreto Big Band, and after that comes the Great Quartet, and a great quartet indeed, McCoy Tyner, Freddie Hubbard, Ron Carter, and Tony Williams. This broadcast has been a presentation of Chicagoland Public Radio. The executive producer is Linda Prince. Technical director, Ken Gagne. Program director, Johanna Walken. Program engineer, Claude Cunningham. Music mix technician, Ken Rasick. Stage director, Jim Nader. Assistant stage director, Heidi Ruiz. Assistant to the producer, Doug Long. Stage and recording technician, Craig Alton. Production assistant, Al Rudd. Chief engineer, Joe DeFranco. And extending a special thank you to our roving reporter, Larry Smith. Mayor Burns Chicago Cool Jazz Festival is sponsored jointly by the Mayor's Office of Special Events, Cool Cigarettes, and the Jazz Institute of Chicago. For Chicagoland Public Radio, I'm Neil Tesser. I'm Larry Smith. I'm Linda Prince. And I'm Dick Buckley. Good night. Thank you.